I'm I'm going to talk a little bit today about uh, more uh, a bit more about research that we've been doing uh, because I see the world through that lens, um, uh, <laughs> not self promotion hopefully, but that's how I see the world. That's how I start. Uh, understanding the world. So as Shivani mentioned, you know, a lot of the work in my lab is trying to understand uh, the impacts humans have uh, on the species we cohabit the world with. And in this, in this, um, in this journey, uh, I was, uh, I became quite fascinated by um, um, the idea of studying emerging infectious diseases uh, coming from a, a ecological eco-evolutionary perspective. So uh, Abhi has already shown this to you, uh, and this is something which is kind of a map which you wake up thinking about, uh, you know, um, there's various predictions about uh, spillover or zoonoses, right? Uh, and uh, it's something we've all been thinking about this last year uh, more than ever before. Uh, and meta-analyses of uh, zoonoses or spillover events that have happened in the past suggest that, um, as Abhi also mentioned, there are several correlates uh, and we don't know whether they're drivers, they're correlates of uh, emergence, a uh, high mammal biodiversity, high land use change, high human population density, and of course, high, high livestock density. And together, uh, all of these make India uh, pretty much uh, one of the hotspots uh, for disease emergence. Um, uh, since I work on wildlife, uh, I'm very interested in the first part of that, a chain of how do these uh, pathogens actually spill over from uh, you know biodiversity uh, to humans uh, i work a lot on mammals uh, and uh, because mammals are close to us uh, evolutionarily uh, it's in particular uh, that mammals uh, are reservoirs for several of these zoonoses uh, and some recent work for example has shown that you know bats and rodents both of which uh, are kind of most of mammals uh, have uh, harbor uh, many, many uh, viruses. Um, and that's, of course, uh, known, but something to just remember. Uh, especially interesting is that it's usually bats that we associate with viruses, but rodents also are potential reservoirs for viruses. So I'm going to tell you a couple of stories of research from my group uh, on bats uh, and rodents. So um, when I think, uh, when we started thinking about this, uh, you know, a lot of work which happens on spillovers is post hoc, uh, as uh, uh, Sir Jeremy was mentioning, uh, you know, with the COVID pandemic, we've been trying to catch up. But what if we try to understand when and how spillover actually happens? So what, uh, so this is what I was interested in. And I thought that, you know, maybe the way to start this exploration is to start with locations which may have high biodiversity, uh, high land use change and high human population density. And so this basically immediately throws up uh, two biodiversity hotspots in India, the Eastern Himalaya uh, or the Northeastern part of India, which has very high biodiversity. Uh, and while not having such high human population density, it has a very high human biodiversity interface. Uh, a lot of uh, interaction between humans and biodiversity. And in the context of the Eastern Himalaya, we've worked uh, pretty extensively on a bat harvest in Nagaland. I'll tell you more about it. Nagaland is a state in Northeastern India. Uh, the biodiversity hotspot in the world with the highest human population diversity is the Western Ghats. We have many endemic species here uh, in Southern India. Uh, and uh, so basically uh, this is another uh, kind of a, a location where we've been doing some work, especially in the context of these mixed use landscapes, fragmented landscapes, which, which are very common uh, in this area. So bats are much maligned and demonized uh, for the various EIDs, uh, uh, the emerging infectious diseases, which uh, have come from them uh, eventually. Um, and this map just uh, is one of the many which has been uh, put together to represent this. Uh, but I think what's very interesting is uh, how do they actually harbor so many of these viruses? Uh, they don't seem to be sick. Uh, those are very, very big questions, uh, but I was uh, kind of interested in understanding more about bats uh, in the context of Northeast India and the context of the viruses they harbor. So this is a really beautiful picture. It's not from the Northeast, it's from a cave uh, in, 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 central, in the Central Western Ghats. Um, 
and you can see, I'm sure you can see a lot of bat eyes, right? So there's tons and tons of bats that live in caves. Um, and, you know, basically these are very high density environments, which we assume might be venues for uh, transmission and evolution of viruses uh, as well. So the bat harvest I'm going to talk about is basically it's it's a cultural um, uh, annual cultural uh, uh, harvest of bats which happens uh, from a cave from caves and uh, there's several uh, several bat harvesting villages in Nagaland. We worked in a village called Mimi, which is quite close to the Myanmar border, and every year here. Um, uh, residents uh, of Mimi and uh, members of the Bomer tribe come together from various villages uh, and they smoke a cave. Uh, uh, bats come out uh, because they're asphyxiated. At the time, they, uh, the bats are killed and then these bats uh, are consumed and exchanged uh, as part of a, a, um, a, a harvest um, a festival. So this is just a picture to show you, uh, for example, you can see on the ground, uh, there's also, the whole village has gathered and on the ground, all of that black is dead bats. OK, so this is definitely immediately obvious visually a high intensity uh, human uh, animal interface. And many times the bats are injured, they bleed. Uh, and so uh, as, as are the people, because the bats may scratch them and so on. So it's a very uh, interesting interface to study uh, the evolution or uh, the dynamics uh, between bats and humans of viruses. Uh, we started out initially uh, in collaboration with NIMHANS, uh, looking uh, for evidence of Lisa virus, uh, uh, that uh, rabies is one of them, uh, we talked about. Um, and uh, we were able to show uh, several years ago that there was serological evidence of Lisa virus, uh, whether it's rabies or not, we don't know, uh, but there was some evidence. So this overall seemed like an interesting possibility. So basically uh, our interest was, you know, what are the RNA viruses these bats carry? And we basically use, we sample these bats and we use molecular biology tools to try and understand or to isolate genetic material from these bats and then figure out uh, using existing databases what this might be. So we may be dealing with unknown diversity, right? There are so many viruses we know nothing about. So most of it is, it's like a fishing expedition. We don't know what we're going to find. Uh, but because of that, uh, to not keep it merely a fishing expedition, we were curious to know uh, more about pathogenicity, some way of exploring that. So basically we tried to look at serological evidence that is uh, basically using antibodies, uh, looking for immunological response uh, of exposure to known pathogens, okay? So uh, in this case, we want to look at both the bats and the people, uh, the villagers who are involved uh, in this traditional bat harvest. Uh, just to convince you that uh, we, we are quite safe and we wear protective gear while doing all of this work because there's always a potential for uh, infectivity as you, you've learned this last year. Uh, and we were able to, because this is an intense event, we were able to actually get a lot of samples of bats, of, in this case, two bats, fruit bat species uh, from the cave. And basically uh, what we do is then we come back to the lab and we screen for several viral families. And we have found, for example, a positive amplification or evidence for genetic material for several viral families, um, including paramyxoviruses, uh, which are uh, you know, the family of Nipah and Hendra. Uh, we are still in the process of sequencing whole genomes. That's a bit harder. But with these short fragments, we can throw them into what's called a phylogeny, where we compare them to known existing information and try and infer what are they closest to, what might these unknown sequences be. So we're not, we don't have the actual uh, virus because we've, we've broken it up uh, because that's the way we collect it to be safer. Uh, but we're trying to figure out what it is from its sequence in some sense. And uh, of course, not just viruses, several uh, bacterial, uh, uh, let's say families, which could be pathogenic, but need not be, uh, are also present uh, in these bats, okay? So just to summarize, uh, I didn't show you these results, uh, but we've also looked at serology for filoviruses, uh, the family which includes uh, Ebola. 
Uh, and what we found is that there are several, uh, of course, several potential pathogens which are circulating in these bats, which are consumed uh, by people here. Uh, we also found uh, serological evidence for three antigenically unique filoviruses in bats and two in humans, and two of these matched. Okay, so the bats had antibodies, serological, uh, they showed response to specific viral families which the humans also showed responses to, suggesting that there may have been uh, some spillover of something, right? We don't know what it is. Uh, so basically this establishes that this bad harvest is a really, is potentially a high risk interface for spillover. Uh, and it's a good system to study the dynamics of this. Uh, how does this happen? So of course, we've just scratched the tip of the iceberg and maybe long-term detailed studies are necessary for us to understand much more. Uh, and, and we are, as I said, trying to sequence whole genomes and understand this better. Before I move on, you know, bats are critical uh, in terms of the ecosystem services they provide, they're pollinators, they render incredible pest control, uh, they're seed dispersers and they help with forest regeneration. So we can't simply get rid of bats. That is just not a solution, that is an option. I'm going to move quickly to the Western Ghats. Uh, and here I'm going to talk about a mixed use landscape. So this is a tea plantation called Kadumane. Uh, you can see it's in the state of Karnataka. And uh, there's really a lot of very interesting ecological literature on this phenomenon called defaunation, which is basically the loss of you know, large, uh, large mammals, large species. Uh, and when you have a loss of these large species, like large ungulates, maybe elephants, um, and you know other uh, ungulates, um, elephants are not ungulates. Uh, and then basically what happens is you have an increase uh, in things like rodents. So their densities increase, okay? So um, it also so happens that these defaunated landscapes, like say a tea plantation, is where humans uh, are also living, right? So this is again, a, a potentially high risk uh, interface where you have um, these mixed use landscapes. And I'll just show you in a minute, uh, just to show you that this is how we do field work. We catch rodents uh, both uh, on the ground and on trees, just to, to make sure we are capturing the entire community or the whole set of species which lives here. And this map shows you, for example, what fragmentation looks like. So you can see there's a very small area, right? It's like three kilometer by eight kilometer or something like that, right? So it's a really small area, but in this small area, there are so many different habitats from forest to grassland, to tea, to abandoned uh, plantations, uh, you know, uh, to built up areas, uh, labor lines where uh, the people who work these plantations live uh, and so on. And in each of these habitats, uh, different species of rodents live. Uh, and so uh, basically there's a possibility for uh, uh, both the community to be different. And because there are interfaces between these different communities, between a grassland and a, um, a built up area for transmission then uh, of any potential pathogens between the rodents in these areas and then a further transmission to humans, right? So uh, we were looking here, I mean, what pathogen? So we started by looking at a bacterial uh, uh, bug uh, called Bartonella. It uh, is it does have several pathogenic lineages. Uh, and so what we did is we, we sampled rodents and we looked for again, genetic evidence of Bartonella. And very surprisingly, we found that almost 50% of the rodents uh, had Bartonella, right? They, they, were, uh, they had Bartonella lineages, which they were supporting uh, in their blood. Uh, and very uh, interestingly, the most abundant species, Rattus satare, it's a rat, uh, had uh, you know exceptionally high prevalence on the order of uh, 70 or 80 percent. Um, and some commensals, which are uh, uh, rodents which live with humans, so Rattus satare is a forest, uh, Western Ghats forest endemic. It's an endemic of the Western Ghats and it lives in the Western Ghats forests, whereas commensals uh, like rats, uh, ratus, ratus, and mus musculus uh, live with humans and they don't necessarily live in the forest, but some of them also had high prevalence. Uh, and basically, uh, irrespective of the commensals, uh, these uh, endemic rodents were abutting uh, areas where humans uh, were living. So 
that might be but there are so many bartonella maybe none of these are pathogenic and it doesn't really matter at all so we don't really know uh, what we can do is again uh, you know place our bartonella sequences in the context of a larger phylogeny of bartonella and what we see is that um, you know five of our uh, bartonella uh, lineages uh, fall into zoonotic lineages known to be zoonotic lineages uh, this doesn't prove that what we have have are zoonotic lineages but it suggests that they might be and again we need to uh, do much more research to try and understand uh, what is pathogenic how do we predict that and so on uh, interestingly we found that <coughs> sorry the mites which were on these um, rodents uh, when we looked at uh, bartonella sequences from them they were identical to the rodents which they were on suggesting that these are potential vectors uh, for for bartonella so in 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 summary basically uh, you know again uh, here uh, of course this was kind of a duh in some sense uh, we chose this uh, site for this reason uh, um, this mixed use landscape which is uh, like lots of fragmented bits of habitat uh, does in a biodiversity hotspot does appear to be a high risk environment again potentially for spillover uh, there's high prevalence and diversity in the rodent community including in commensals of potentially zoonotic lineages uh, and several and then as i said just now uh, they some of the, some of them several of them do seem to be potentially pathogenic but this still doesn't help it's just still it's still like discovery right it's just looking at what's there it's just about pattern so how do we actually understand more about the dynamics of this partner this is a very difficult question i think uh, and it will require us to understand you know much more about the geographical distributions of the hosts and the vectors the transmission dynamics and cycles and how that responds to environmental change something i've not mentioned at all here i've been talking about human induced habitat loss uh, hunting uh, and habitat modification uh, but climate change is definitely going to play into all of these things and we have not addressed it at all uh, and i guess the ultimate question is whether some of this information can really be used uh, to minimize risk before there are spillover events and i've been fascinated recently uh, by this literature trying to uh, decouple or understand hazard and risk so what is hazard i mean basically uh, bats carry viruses and bats are going to live in caves in multi species assemblages and they are going to exchange these viruses those caves are going to be hot spots of viral uh, evolution right um, from our understanding of sars cov2 it may have spilled over several times and it was in humans where there was selection for the specific genetic variant which is you know then uh, became a pandemic right so um, the hazard is there but can we minimize the risk so the risk is basically intersection of the hazard exposure and vulnerability for example vulnerability could be minimized if we had a vaccine right uh, so can we understand uh, this relative uh, you know contribution of hazard and risk uh, and then maybe um, you know maybe minimize uh, the possibility of spillover so this is something which i would love to explore in the future and i'm fercinated right now i keep i'm mercurial but i'm fascinated right now by cave systems in meghalaya where there are you know big caves small caves lots of bats fewer bats um different species of bats fewer species of bats and this excellent comparative systems already set up uh, where maybe we can try and explore some of these uh, equivolutionary dynamics and also uh, try and look more at the human interface i have not done that so far but it's something which does certainly fascinate me so you've heard from abi and others about this you know this conceptual framework of one health it's very exciting and it sounds uh, disruptive uh but uh, i guess um you know i i i hope this doesn't sound um inappropriate but you know in india we really do work in silos and um cross talk uh, is often somehow doesn't happen so i'm hoping that uh, such cross talk can happen and one of the uh, efforts which i have been recently uh, trying to engage with of course uh, uh, work too with abi as part of the biodiversity collaborative there i'm uh, helping Uh, a little bit with the uh, biodiversity ecosystem services 
uh, vertical and also hopefully uh, will work with Abhi on the One Health uh, and Zoonoses part. But uh, we've also been engaging recently uh, in trying to set up a multi, uh, you know, institutional, um, multi-interest uh, collaborative venture called One Health City Bengaluru. Uh, and the idea is to, uh, in a large global urban center like Bangalore, which has wildlife, it has you know, wild animals, it has people, it has domesticated animals, livestock and so on at very high densities. Can we uh, you know, basically study disease ecology, land use land cover change, uh, do environmental surveillance of lakes, uh, you know, um, bring in uh, modeling and prediction uh, with, you know, cutting edge pathogen genomics and a very strong component of really self critique. How do we go from biology to one health? We can understand maybe something about biology, though that itself to me sometimes seems overwhelming because there's so many complex interactions here. Um, and then of course, uh, a very critical aspect of networking and communication uh, and citizen science outreach and education. So, um, so this is something which is just a concept concept right now. Uh, we don't know where it'll go, but I, I do hope, uh, and there are also uh, collaborators from Ashoka involved here, and I hope that this will take off. So I have to uh, end now. Uh, I hope I didn't take too much time. Uh, and then uh, just thank, uh, I guess I did take a bit more time, uh, thank the wonderful uh, students uh, whom I'm very lucky to work with, who are willing to wear PPE and uh, sample bats uh, and uh, this helped in the last year when they all took part in COVID efforts. Thank you.